The road to the White House for General Dwight Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of Allied Forces in World War II Europe, began on June 5th, 1944, D-Day Eve, when he said, okay, let's go. His order meant that the massive military force under his command would invade Nazi-occupied Europe the next day. This advice, Eisenhower is very much of a surprise to our, uh, to our group. And we heard about it. Someone came running up and saying, Eisenhower is here, Eisenhower is here. And at that point, uh, it was about 8.30 in the evening, we were all ready to go, ready to go to the planes, as a matter of fact. And the attitude of almost everybody was, so, so Eisenhower is here, you know. We, we're, we love him, but we have, we have other things to think about right now. I was standing out in front of our tent, and suddenly up the street came this gang, I guess you'd call them, senior officers, staff, and Eisenhower. And he said, uh, what's your name, Lieutenant? I told him. He said, where are you from? And I said, Michigan. And he said, ah, Michigan. Great fishing in Michigan. I've fished there many times. And he said, uh, are you well prepared? Are your men ready to go on this? And I said, yes, sir. Have you received all of the plans properly? And you're, you're well equipped? I said, yes, sir, we're all set to go. And a couple of the men yelled in the background at that time, don't worry, General, we'll take care of it. The largest invasion ever mounted in the history of warfare. Some 150,000 soldiers, including 13,000 paratroopers, and more than 2,000 ships and 11,000 aircraft began the assault on Normandy's heavily defended beaches in the pre-dawn hours of June 6. I think it was like 3 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the morning that they got us up and we went on to our LCAs. That was a boat that carried about our, our one platoon, about 30 men, and we uh, departed off the ship going down our rope ladders, got on there, it had been delayed because of the bad seas. Well, it was not a calm sea that day either. That boat was just rocking every which way, so you had to be careful that you landed in the boat and not in the water. We circled around the ocean a long time before we ever headed towards France. As we approached, the fact that really affected us was that machine gun fire that was coming from the east. and. The sad part of it for the 29th Division is they were closer to most of those machine guns than we were. They were east of us, and as we were coming along, you, you could see the slaughter that was going on over there. A few years earlier, General Eisenhower was a relatively unknown officer in the U.S. Army, a force ill-prepared for war of any kind. But on December 7, 1941, Japanese aircraft attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and America was at war. Eisenhower reported to duty Sunday morning, the 14th of December, about 9 o'clock. I took him down to General Giroux's office, and then Marshall sent for both of them at 11 o'clock. And for 20 minutes, General Marshall described the situation in the world, primarily what was going on in the Philippines, and then turned to Eisenhower and said, what course of action uh, do you think we ought to take? He told the general that he thought, in view of the size of the Japanese army and the, and the various islands they'd taken and the fact that they were obviously going to take the Philippines, that it would be impossible to foresee the recapture of the Philippines anytime soon, but that the real crisis was in Europe. Those who worked close to Ike at Supreme Headquarters were impressed with his management of the huge operation. He was a man of presence. He was a man of sincerity. He had that great God-given quality of being fine with a crowd, but very sincere and interested in his exchanges with individuals. And I can assure you that it meant a lot to them and to their mothers who knew about it. Eisenhower was an anticipator. He was a great administrator, not necessarily doing all of that work himself, but he always made sure that the mechanisms and responsibilities were in force to achieve the purpose for which it was all designed. He could be tough, he could be rough, but it was under control 
He never, ever looked down trodden or below the line. It was just something magnificent about the way he looked and, and, and exuded when he got around people. Uh, you couldn't think about defeat or marching back home. You knew there was hope in the corpus. He kept my hope all, alive all the time, I can tell you that. The truth is that the whole coastline and in depth of southern England became a great armed camp. Everything from jeeps to tanks, you know, armoured vehicles, ambulances, whatever you can think of, three-ton trucks and all the rest of it. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them on the road verges everywhere and concealed wherever there was foliage. I mean, woods and copses, in churchyards, in schoolyards, in pe private people's gardens. Everywhere you looked, the whole place was a great armed centre, ready for the moment when the whole lot would pounce across the channel. And finally, the day arrived. I remember I was standing down near the Bristol Channel when this big fleet of ships started moving out. And we heard the announcement on the loudspeakers of General Eisenhower's voice telling us that the big day had come and we were moving toward the liberation of Europe. You are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. More than 50 years later, I'm deeply moved by it because his voice conveyed this feeling that we were engaged in something very noble, something very worthwhile. We weren't just going over there to kill people, we were going to liberate the whole continent of Europe.